Happy autumn, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this City of Creeks presentation focused on the Trash and Creeks study. I'm Jessica Wilson, Interim Division Manager of Environmental Monitoring and Compliance. While you won't have time during this talk to walk 110 miles like our scientists did for this study, I fully support team members taking this as a walking meeting on their phones to enjoy the physical and mental benefits Good being outside in this gorgeous time. weather. This past winter, yeah, staff from our department collected 19,467 observations so. in 20 creeks across Austin in an effort to evaluate trash intensity and sources across the city. Results did not indicate statistically relevant correlations. However, the study did yield new insights to the problem facing our community. Please join me in welcoming Applied Watershed Research Supervisor Andrew Clayman as he shares more about the study and recommended strategies to address trash in our community. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Jessica. So, um, yeah, 110 miles in Austin Creeks. I had mentioned that to someone and I thought, wow, how do we pack 110 miles of creeks into our city? And uh, actually, it's pretty easy. Um, creek miles wiggle and, and wind all through our city. And actually, we only looked at 110 miles. If you want to talk about just the creek main stems, we actually have about twice that much. We have about 200 miles of creek main stems, just these name, big named creeks, uh, just in our city limits. We're not even talking about the ETJ here. If you want to expand that out to ETJ, you're looking more like 500 miles. And if you want to include all the little tributaries that float all the little creek, we've actually have thousands of miles of creeks. But we're just going to be focusing on a couple of select creeks, the big ones uh, here in the um, in the city limits. Our big study and all our benchmarking basically just said that all the trash in the creeks, where it's located, how much of it is, what kind of it is, it doesn't correlate well to all the sources that you think of. Um, a lot of people point fingers. Oh, it's the apartments. Oh, it's the commercial facilities. Oh, it's it's these people who back it up against the creek. Oh, it's the dumpers. Oh, it's the campments. Oh, it's this. You know what? What we found is really there are no single scapegoats. We can't point to any one thing because the problem is all of us. And the solution has got to come in a three-pronged approach. Um, we still have to get it out of the creeks. Obviously, that's what we've been doing for years and years. And we have to somehow stop it from getting to the creeks. Um, that's what we call that interception. And we're, we're kind of doing that now, but I think there's opportunities to do that better. But ultimately, we're going to be extracting and intercepting till the end of time if we don't actually reduce a lot of this stuff that's getting in our community in general. Because once it's in the community, believe me, it's in the creeks. I've seen it. What was the, why did we do this? Um, for years and years, uh, Jessica, actually for, for more than a decade, uh, Jessica has been talking to Mateo and talking to me and saying, you know, there's a lot of shopping carts in the creek. There's a lot of trash in the creek. So what can we do about this? And for, for the longest time, Mateo and, and, and the rest of us were like, well, you know, we, we look at pollutants, uh, you know, a plastic bottle really isn't a pollutant and a shopping cart really isn't a pollutant. We're, we're busy looking at stuff in the water. And I think for, so for the longest time, our group has uh, largely uh, ignored trash, considering it kind of more of an aesthetic problem. But the uh, city council was approached by a lot of citizens saying the trash is getting worse. It's getting worse. Uh, we got to do something about this. They were also talking about encampments at the time. That's back when we had the bans. And they were talking about uh, there's scooters all over the place, the scooters. So the, 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 the um, council had a lot of these complaints. And so they directed the city manager through a CIUR to do stuff about it. And we, we gave them lots of information, but some of the things they asked for were these, uh, they want maps, they want trends, they want data, they want BMPs, they want recommendations. And that's something that we couldn't just hand them ready because we didn't have. So we had to embark on a field study and some uh, study design and some uh, benchmarking program. The study design was actually really difficult. At first I thought, well, this is a pollution problem. You've got source, you've got in, contribute uh, things in the, in the creek. We've got to go upstream and downstream. Uh, and that really didn't work. We tried, tried a few pilot projects of, of looking at creek. We looked at East Bolden Creek. And we found that the, the trash that's in these creeks is so incredibly variable and it's so weirdly distributed that it didn't seem to make sense with just doing upstream or downstream. And we, we couldn't really characterize one watershed over another because they were so vastly different. If you go to, to Williamson Creek, it's just full of tin cans for some reason. It was We started to call it Tin Can Creek. We couldn't figure it out. There was a tin can every hundred feet in this entire creek. In Shoal Creek, you really didn't find that, but you found a lot of clothing. And it, it, it was just really bizarre and, and not uniform. So we decided to go brute force field study. We were going to walk all of these creeks top to bottom, every foot of the creek, we're going to walk it. And we're going to take an observation every 30 feet because it changes so rapidly. This 
basically wound up to be about 19,467 data points. That is a huge data set. And I felt comforted by that, uh, not just because of my kind of German overdo it gestalt kind of mentality, but when you have a data set that is that big, it's, um, you, you basically get rid of some of these weird anomalies of, of, of things that would happen. For example, you know, neighborhoods do cleanups and, uh, and some of our field ops do cleanups. So these are weird, weird anomalies where something might be clean, whereas it's actually dirty. It's just that it's been clean recently. But if you have 20,000 data points, you kind of wash some of those anomalies out of the way. And taking these observations every 30 feet means we can get a really high resolution on problems getting bigger, getting smaller, how intense they are. And we didn't just look in the creek. At first, I took the council's direction um, at face value and said, okay, I'll just look in the creek. Most of the trash is not in the creek. In fact, you can walk just a creek bed and not see any trash, but it's on the banks and it's up in the floodplain. So we looked kind of like uh, left and to the right uh, out into the floodplain. Uh, so one of the things that council wanted to know, I'm not going to focus on this for this study really, was scooters. They were worried about all these scooters getting thrown in creeks. Anecdotally, they were saying people threw them in Ladybird, which they do, and they threw them in creeks. And there's a there's a lithium-ion battery and, and other electronic components that's a terrible water quality problem, which is debatable. But yes, you don't want to have electronics and, and batteries in, 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 the, in the water. We worked with... Um, 311 and 311 worked with ATD, Austin Transportation Department, and they, uh, in their app, their existing 311 app, and if you don't have the 311 app, get it on your smartphone immediately. Uh, you just download the Austin 311 app, and any any problem that you see that's that's in their uh, service options, you can just report to them uh, seamlessly. You can give them any kind of direction. In this case, what they did was they, they had an option there. You can click on scooters. And if you see a scooter, you could take a picture or put a location and send it to them. They immediately then contact ATD. ATD contacts the vendor if it's, uh, you know, whoever the scooter brand is. And that vendor is required to go get it themselves in short order. And I tried this myself. I saw a scooter. I took a picture. I sent it to the app. And within 24 hours, that scooter was plucked out of the creek. So it's a very efficient, very effective process. We only found 21 scooters total. And those are now gone. So I feel like we really got a handle on that situation. One of the... Uh, a small success, but a really good one. Uh, in addition to just making these observations of where the scooters are and stuff like that, we also took uh, every 30 foot, we we gave the, the, that 30 foot section a score between zero and 20. And it was a multifaceted scoring approach. It wasn't just the total volume. Notice I've got little icons there and in the small category. It's, a, you know, a gallon or less of trash volume. And the next one is a, a, a five gallon bucket and then kind of like the park um, trash can, and then one of those big gray bins, or maybe multiple bins. So you've got these four main categories. But it's also not just the volume, it's also the effort, the time it takes to clean it up. For example, if you had a million pieces of cotton that all fit fit in, in one gallon jug, that would push the score up. And also the basic description. You know, if you go to the site and you see this 30 foot, would you say it's horrible or good? So the score was can be used in many different ways. Uh, at the same time of evaluating this, if we saw within that 30 foot reach, a source, like a dumpster was overflowing, or there was an encampment, or someone had backed their truck out and dumped a bunch of bags, or maybe uh, property management. This is where someone has a parking lot, and they just leaf blow all the blo leaves and trash into the creek because you know, the leaf blower is not going to differentiate the candy wrapper from a, from a leaf. We call that bad property management. So we, we, we put the sources where the sources are at, hoping after 19,467 data points that we'd be able to correlate the sources and their percent contribution to the amount of trash. So here's the takeaway one. This is when you crunch all that data into a cute little colorful graphics. On the right-hand side, you'll see a pie chart. And that big pie wedge, about two-thirds of the pie, uh, was encampment. So this is sources by occurrence. So if you just enumerate the number of times we saw any one of these sources, encampment was the most frequent source. Um, then, of course, you have another big contributors or another outfall or a tributary coming in, dumping in trash, or maybe dumping recent unknown. That means someone backed a truck up and, and threw garbage bags out or other types of dumping. Immediately, someone might grab this graphic and go, aha, encampment's the problem. But the problem with this is that if you're looking for things in a creek, you're going to find encampments. That's where encampments are. So that's part of this uh, graphic needs to be disclaimed as the experimental design bias. If you're going to go to a place where these things occur, then obviously you're going to find them most often. What I'm more interested in on the left-hand graph, that's called a box and whisker graph, where the whiskers, the long skinny lines, is kind of showing you sort of where the, the, the range is. And then uh, the box itself is showing the percentile. So that's most of the data. Between the 25th and 75th percentile is the box. And that horizontal line in the middle is the median. So that's kind of like the average value, sort of the middle value. If you look at these different sources, they're basically all fall in the same category. Uh, and camp being that yellow one, notice it's got a, a wide range, but its range is pretty much the same 
as those like five or six others, and that the median value is not the highest value. So encampment itself, although it is frequent in occurrence, is not necessarily more intense than any of the other categories. The super fun thing about this brute force data collection where you take so many data points is then you can you can come up with a really great map. On the map on the right is what you'd see if you look it up online. And this is available to, to anybody, though the website is kind of obscured there. There's a, a color-coded map of exactly where all the trash is. The intense parts are in dark and the, and the, the light trash is in light. On the left-hand side, you can then drill down into any particular watershed. Like this is the, this is the headwater of of Shoal Creek, kind of from where Mopac and 183 meet down to about uh, 45th, maybe. And it shows you in those red spots, those hot spots, that's where really intense trash is. That's where that awful, there's bins of dumpsters full of trash. And then you can look on the right-hand side at the different categories of sources that were associated in proximity to those. And you'll notice at the very top of the watershed, there's an active encampment. You look on the left-hand side, that active encampment, which is that magenta with an X in the middle, yeah, it's, it's associated with, with high trash. It's no joke. Encampments absolutely are often associated with trash, even though we did see some encampments that didn't have any trash at all. But now, and then that's going to enable a person to say, aha, tra- encampments are the problem. But if you look down the creek, you'll see these nodes where there's also high trash in other places that are not associated with encampments, but they are associated with several other sources. Dumping is with a little square with a D. There's property management issues, lots of apartments right there. So lots of trash being blown off parking lots. So the basic gist of this is that we can get this map and then we can start to tweeze out what is correlated with what. I'm going to go really fast over this because this is how messy the data looks. And this is actually not just raw data. This is distilled data. This is after after you condense and amalgamate some of these information. But each of these watersheds can be looked at differently. And notice how different each watershed is. These are the uh, 20 watersheds we looked at. Um, some watersheds are totally flat. Barton Creek, top left. Trash occurs in different places, but pretty much it's all about all the same. There's no trend from upstream to downstream. The next one, Blunt Creek is actually there is more trash in the headwater of Blunt Creek and there's less trash at the mouth, which is backward. You would assume the trash would accumulate as you go downstream. Some of those happen. Um, The reason why I have this graph in here is just to show you what a mess, pun intended, trash in creeks is. It doesn't follow, it doesn't play by the rules. It doesn't move like a normal pollutant would. And each watershed is is very different in how that, how it hangs up. I give all this data to our brilliant geospatial analysis uh, folks. We put small buffers around the trash, like a, a 300 foot thinking, okay, well, most of the trash is pretty much concentrated around that area. You could see riparian ownership would be more influential than say the, the surrounding watershed. But we also looked at the surrounding watershed. So we put 300 and 3000 foot buffers, and then we can put different layers on population by census, how much transportation, impervious cover, land uses, multifamily, single family, commercial. Uh, We can look at all these different attributes and try to make correlations and say, okay, where is the problem? If we, if, if, for example, we knew all the problem was coming from a certain type of land use, then we can focus on that, the solutions on that and get more bang for our uh, buck and our effort. And this is where Andrew becomes extremely disappointed and sad because no matter how we looked at this, and believe me, we looked at the six ways from Sunday. We tried every layer we could think of. We tried different size buffers. We tried different types of clusterings. And there were just no statistically significant correlations. It didn't matter whether it was single family land use, where you would assume someone would be really you know, vested in the, in the area around them, or whether it was multifamily or commercial, or whether it was parks, or whether it was most, uh, lots of impervious cover. It blew my mind that there was not a single statistically significant correlation between an attribute and the trash. But I'm telling you, after I walk 110 miles of these creeks, I understand why. And that's because trash doesn't flow through a, a system from a source and then downstream just like any other pollutant would. It's physical. It stops. You'll find these backwater eddies where all the trash is trapped. Or you'll find these areas of, of thick vegetation where all the, all the stuff gets hung up. Or you'll find where the stream widens and the energy goes down, so then all the trash kind of stops and then goes fast again when the stream narrows. So the physical attributes of a, of a stream has huge impacts on where the trash stops and where it is. And there is everything in these creeks. It, it doesn't matter. It was construction related. It was traffic work related. It was encampment related. It was kid related. There was toys everywhere. It's retail. It's every single thing you can buy, trade, beg, borrow, or steal in this town is in the creeks. There's lawnmowers. There's all kinds of stuff. The most frequent thing we did find, if you were to just, you know, one of everything, it's going to be single use plastics. All the bottles, all of the um, fast food containers, all these single single use things we we depend on are there. And when people say, 
trash is increasing in this town. I, I believe it. And I don't think it's just that just because of our population is increasing or, or just because changes in demographics or changes in encampments. It's because we are all growing more and more dependent on all of these single-use plastics. You can't avoid it nowadays. I know people who do. Ana Gonzalez is, is one of kind of my mentors in using less stuff. And, and it's, even, it's even impossible for her to avoid it. We need to, though, because it's all in our creeks. If it passes through our hands, it's going to get to our creeks. Takeaway number five here is that where you find the trash is really interesting. And those dents, those really horrible lots of bins worth of trash and there's just a 30-foot reach, those are only 10% of our creek distance. And although it's only 10%, so let's say out of 110 miles, 11 of those miles, 10%, has 76% of all of the trash. And these areas are just areas of deposition of trash during small storm events because that's where the trash gets stuck. But it's also an area of export. It's also an area that propagates trash because in a big storm event, a lot of that stuff will mobilize and go downstream. So it occurs to me that this is an opportunity. If we were to focus on just these sites, we may stop a lot of that transport of the 76% of all the trash that's in our creeks. Uh, so it's kind of a strategic site selection type opportunity. And I want to stop anybody by thinking, oh, well, if the trash is getting stopped by all these trees, all we have to do is get rid of all these trees in the creeks and then the, the trash will just flow on, which is actually the opposite of what we want because it'll just go, it'll go somewhere. It goes to the lake. These trees are actually an opportunity. They, they stop the trash forest. They're kind of like trash catchers. So they're strainers. They strain out the trash so that we can then get them out before it gets to the, the lake and then the Gulf of Mexico. Only. So the field report provided a lot of information, and it also provided some very site-specific recommendations, as as well as some kind of like uh, structural control opportunities, and then larger uh, things like education outreach and coordination with partners. But uh, at the same time, I, I was out in the creeks doing this with other staff, Layla Goslink. I hope you guys remember Layla Goslink, super wonderful woman from our, from our group engineer. She was doing benchmarking. So she was researching regionally and nationwide and even globally. What are other municipalities, what are other organizations, how are they approaching this problem? Because everybody's got this problem. But she distilled it down to three type of categories for what others are doing. And that goes back to that extraction. How do you physically get it out? How do you keep it from getting to the creeks? Because we know it's going to be on our landscape. And then how do you reduce the flow of all this crud getting into our creeks in the first place? So extraction. There's a lot of neat novelty things out there. There's new technologies. There's little robots that'll go and swim around and clean up stuff. There are large uh, collecting devices. Of course, this is a boom. We, we do use some booms on the floating booms on the on Ladybird. But this has a little, a little machine at the end that kind of grabs it. We found a lot of these devices were, were neat novelties and may may work for some places, but they wouldn't really work for us. And that's because of the way our, our storms come in uh, fast and furious and unpredictable. And these little devices would get clogged up with all the leaf litter and sticks and twigs and organic matter. Anecdotally, John Beachy says that approximately 80% of all the floating debris at Waterloo is, is organic material. And you, you can't just scoop that up all together because then you just have to separate it out anyway. So we really have to strategically just pluck the trash out. So that kind of goes back to just Physical labor is really just the way to, to go about these. None of these uh, new contraptions will work. And we actually had a guy from France bring us one of these cool little robots that you plunk in the water and it swims around and picks up trash. Although he said it might work in some places like Wallaloo Inlet, maybe he wouldn't even put it in Ladybird because he thought it was going to scoop up too much plants and too much fish and stuff. So definitely wouldn't work for our area. We're just going to have to brute force pick it up. But there are ways you can crowdsource this stuff. And I know that the I've just been uh, notified that the Austin Rowing Dock actually does some of this. They they, they have a, a meetup group where uh, they'll let you have a free hour's worth of kayak if you promise to bring a, a collect a bag of trash and bring it back. And that's neat. I think we should ramp that up. But there's uh, neat opportunities out there with, with Chicago and, and, and other people around the world that are getting people to kind of see the problem and be a part of the solution. And you can see all these people look pretty happy. They're having a good time. Interception is where you know the trash is on the landscape, you know a storm or wind or whatever is, could bring it to the creek, whether it's through the storm drain or just down the street or something like that. Overflowing dumpsters we found to be a, a big source. And shopping carts, my God, I saw so many shopping carts in the creek. A minimum, somewhere between five and 700 shopping carts we noticed just in our 110 miles. And if you ramp that up to the total number of creeks, you're definitely looking at well over 1,000, maybe even up to 2,000 shopping carts in our creeks, which is which, you know, where are they going to go? They don't float downstream too much. They're going to stay there and accumulate, which is, I think, why we have so many now. So we need to try to get a handle on that. Some places like up north, uh, they have ways to retain the shopping carts on site, whether it's locking mechanism that locks the tires when it goes off site or a, a coin or token operated system where you have to invest to get your cart and then you get your money back when you leave. Or even uh, some places in Philly, I'm told, have bollards where you can't even take the shopping cart 
out of the the sidewalk area. You get outside the store, you take your bags with you, you go to your car and you leave your cart there, which is probably the most uh, physically restrictive. And I like that. Anyway, telecommunications cables, you get your ch- cable changed from a service provider. Uh, a lot of times that supervisor won't touch the other service provider's materials and they'll just cut the cable and let it fall into the creek. They don't, they won't remove it, which I think is a cop out, but there are miles and miles and miles of internet cable and cable TV cable just rolling down our creeks. And I think we've got to get a handle on that. There's so many opportunities of things to do. Interception though, all has to do about capacity, like how big is the waste receptacle, how close you are to it. Interesting. Walt Disney, back uh, years and years ago, Walt Disney uh, had a problem with trash in Disneyland, and he wanted to do a study. How far away does someone have to be from a trash receptacle before they'll you know, they'll actually use it or whether they'll throw it on the ground? He found that 30 feet. Most people won't walk more than 30 feet to throw their trash in a trash can. If the trash can is more than 30 feet away, it's probably going on the ground, which I find to be abhorrent. KAB also did that exact same study and basically came up with the exact same number. So it has to do with about proximity and access. Think about all these kayakers and stand-up paddle boards and stuff, uh, canoers on Ladybird. There's no trash cans out there. So what are they going to do with their trash? A lot of times it maybe incidentally, accidentally gets in the water. Some groups have a place to put a litter boat where you can put the trash, but you know it's very problematic to do that. Who's going to regulate it? How do you deal with it during a storm? So we're trying to wrap our heads around that. And storm drains. Of course, all our storm drains, and our, not all, but most of our uh, storm drains in our in our curbs go straight to a creek now we've tried that before actually we've like an inlet guard where it you know it lets the water go through but not the trash but if you block or clog one of these things now you've got localized flooding that's a big problem our education department has already started something that we we found and said hey it would be a great idea let's do it adopt a drain somebody else is doing it but then i find out of course our education department's way ahead of me as usual. And they've already got this program. They're starting to, to ramp it up. So look to that uh, in your future that individuals may be able to adopt a drain instead of an entire creek. So source reduction is really where it's at. The reason why we have so many all this stuff in our creeks is because of our disposable society. Our, when, we, you, when you get something in the store, it's wrapped in a package that's wrapped in a package. They put it in a bag and then they put that bag in another bag and then you go home. What do you do with all this packaging? So packaging, single-use, disposable things, we're just dependent on them. It's just saturated in our society and it continues to increase. We tried the bag ban, but state politics won't let us regulate containers for food. But that same problem's in Florida. And right now, Florida is regulating styrofoam not as a container, but as as a pollutant because styrofoam is kind of nasty. I think there are, there are ways to get source reduction politically and maybe we, we you know work with our partners and our businesses. Austin Water is really being great. They're adding more water stations so you can reduce your dependence on single use bottles. You know, after a while we'll have more water stations around where carrying around a bottle you can fill it up easier. Someone said to me the other day, I hate I hate having um go into a a restaurant and taking my leftovers in a styrofoam thing. And I said, okay, just carry a Ziploc bag with you or carry your own Tupperware container when you go out to eat. And we can stop depending on others to give us these disposable things. So the bottom line here is that the trash and creeks, it's the result of our whole community. And we, we can't point our finger at any one thing. The problem is us. And we're, there's just more of us every day. So we need to start to wrap our head around how we're going to, as a community, solve this problem. There are lots of partners that are actively engaged in the solution of coffee. So there's TOOF. The other one's foundation is, is, a, is a group that provides people with jobs to go and clean the creek. And that's super wonderful. And there's KAB. They, they keep cream. But uh, we all kind of need to start to be a part of it. And even if it's just uh, personally, I know that uh, Layla Gosling and other people, when they go out for a walk, certainly Jessica does, when they go out for a walk, oh, they you know pick up a piece of trash, throw it in the trash can. I think we all kind of do that at some point or another. That's actually a thing. In Sweden, they started a term called plogging. P-L-O-G-G, plug. It's jogging. It's picking up trash while you're picking up litter while you jog. And it's starting to catch on. I think New Jersey is kind of doing things now. Anyway, certainly be careful and don't pick up anything hazardous. But I think we all are complicit in the problem by engaging in this single-use trash stuff. So let's all be part of that problem, that solution. Now, the next step here is that we are working to improve efficiency and effectiveness of the programs. We're going to work with our partners to do all these kind of three-pronged approach. We're going to go back to council uh, here in a little while and provide them with actual recommendations that they could do, not just directing staff to do stuff, but maybe even politically, where they can start to, to work on some of this reduction uh, instead of just the extraction and the, and the reception, which we're working on. Huge, huge, huge thanks to Layla Gosling, who did all the heavy lifting on the benchmark research. Big thanks to all the people who got in the creeks with us and walked in these creeks and saw depressing and horrible stuff. Jeremy Walker Lee was a, a temporary employee for us. He walked more miles than I think anybody. Of course, most of the members of our, my team walked a lot of miles. And the data management, of course, Rob's always in there. Any, any project you have, you got to have them, someone to manage the data and then do all the GIS work and, and help with the QAPP and all these other things. And of course, big thanks to all the partners who 
get in there routinely and clean up stuff. Uh, WPD field ops, they're on the lake most days of the week, cleaning trash out of the lake day after day, day after day. Key of Awesome Beautiful and all the other groups participate. And there's so many people and thanks to all of you individually who are part of that solution. But that's really the executive summary here is that we are all part of this problem. I'm not going to point at any one thing and say that overflowing dumpster, if, if we if we solved overflowing dumpster, that'd be the problem. There, There's no shortage of problems and we're all part of it. But we're also all part of the solution. And certainly the city itself has some efficiency and some effectiveness changes that we need to make, but it's not an easy problem and it's going to take a long time to solve. Thank you for that presentation, Andrew, and to all of our team members who embarked on this robust study uh, in the field as well as analyzing the data. I'm so glad that you called out our incredible field operations crews for that unseen work, as well as nonprofits and other departments who we've been working on this issue for years, but without this robust data. Uh, and I really think it's an outstanding example of sections like data analysis and decision support and uh, the one that you're with Applied Watershed Research collaborating to provide practical recommendations to our community. It really embodies the, the names for both of those sections. Uh, and thank you for making time to share the information with us today, as well as I know you've been presenting it at lots of community meetings and meetings to, to council and other decision makers. We're lucky to get to work with you. Happy to.